السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوت الا باللہ العلی العظیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین صل اللہ علی سیدنا و نبینا ابی القاسم المصطفی محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بغية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره First we offer our condolences to our beloved Imam, Imam Mahdi أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف for this sad demise anniversary of Lady Zainab سلام الله عليها and we would like to share with our Imam his grief and sorrow over this great loss. Uh, inshallah, what we are going to discuss in these three nights is what is Islamic understanding of happiness or felicity or sa'ada and how we can achieve it. Of course, this is a very broad topic and it needs more uh, time and more uh, you know a kind of engagement of the speaker and also the audience but as much as we can inshallah we'll try to do a little justice to this topic there is a discussion in philosophy about what makes someone happy what is the meaning of pleasure because happiness is to have pleasure to have love and also to be free from pain or alam so what is pleasure what is pain Muslim philosophers normally come up with this idea and this is a, a very important position that if you you know really accept this it has lots of consequences their position is this that pleasure and pain which are two important concepts by which we can define happiness are both a matter of understanding, a matter of knowledge, a matter of knowing. When you know something which is pleasant, as they call it, mulaim, means something which is pleasant, something that in your heart, in your soul, you are happy with, you don't feel any conflict, you don't feel any negativity towards it. If you understand it, and you understand that this is also pleasant, this is bringing you pleasure. So for example, if there is a flower with very beautiful fragrance, and I don't understand because my nose has problem. I cannot smell anything. So I don't have any pleasure here. I wouldn't be enjoying smelling this flower. Although something pleasant is here, but I don't enjoy. Why? Because pleasure is not just to be faced with something which is pleasant. Pleasure is to be able to understand and recognize what is pleasant. Also, if something is pleasant, but it has also other dimensions or aspects to it which are not interesting or nice for me, again, I may have understanding of that, but without enjoying. Imagine, for example, if there is something which is very useful for my health but with bad taste 
So it has one aspect which is pleasant, another aspect which is unpleasant. So here, I may not have the pleasure, or I may have a little pleasure, but more of pain. Indeed, in dunya, it's very hard to find 100% pure pleasure. Pleasures of dunya are all mixed with pains and with difficulties. So, according to Muslim philosophers, pleasure comes, ladha comes, when we understand what is pleasant from also that aspect or in so far as it is pleasant. And the same is with pain. Pain comes when you understand what is unpleasant in so far as it is unpleasant. Sometimes maybe there is something which is very bad, but you don't pay attention, you don't know, you don't notice, or you are sleeping, so you don't have any pain. Sometimes something happens in the society, a person of understanding feels terrible, and people are relaxed. A person wants to die when he sees this, another person is you know, relaxed. Because it's not only a matter of reality, it's a matter of reality and understanding of that reality. As you know, this famous example of Amir al-Mu'minin salam hearing the sad news of the army of Muawiyah harassing a Muslim woman and a Jewish woman and taking away the jewelries of that Jewish lady. Amir al-Mu'minin says that if a Muslim man dies out of sorrow, would not be blamed for this death, indeed he would be praised. He would not be blamed. It means that Imam's understanding of the ugliness of this action is so high that he says a person can die out of pain. But maybe there are people who are relaxed. Maybe there are people who even get involved into such ugly action. So it's not only a matter of reality, it's a matter of understanding that reality. Indeed, you can say the part of knowledge precedes the part of reality because sometimes you may enjoy something which has no reality. <laughs> or you may have pain over something which has no reality. Still, the pleasure and pain are real. If someone falsely give me a news that just now your son had accident and he died, I will feel terrible, I will have pain. Then later I realized that there was a false news. It was a mistake. This doesn't change the fact that I suffered. This doesn't change the fact of the pain. Because happiness and grief, happiness and pain, pleasure and pain, are based on our evaluation, our understanding of the reality. So it's possible that you enjoy and there is no reality there. It's possible that you suffer and there is no reality. Of course, true pleasure and pain are combination of both understanding and reality. Then Muslim philosophers add, among all beings, the one who has greatest pleasure is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, pleasure not in a physical sense, not in a human sense. They call it bahja. Who is the one who has greatest bahja, greatest joy, greatest happiness? Please don't think of this as emotions, because Allah doesn't have emotions. Think of it, as we said, a matter of understanding. Allah has the greatest bahja, the greatest joy. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the greatest understanding of what is the most pleasant thing, which is He Himself. So, no one can be like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to the bahja, the openness or the joy. 
You know, there's a beautiful ayah in the Quran which is very deep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, some people think that we have created the earth and the skies in order to play with them, you know, as a matter of entertainment. If we were in need of entertaining ourselves, we could have done it without creation. I can, you know, enjoy myself more than looking at the cre creation of me by reflecting on myself. If you were in need of love and amusement and entertainment, I could have done it by reflecting on myself. I, was, I had no need to look at other things because what is more enjoyable for me than reflection on the most perfect being, which is of course he himself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the greatest bahja, the greatest happiness and joy. And now, if we come down after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who would have the greatest bahja, the greatest joy, the greatest happiness? Those who have better understanding of the most pleasant being, of the most beautiful being. And that is Urafa. That is the true knowers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have the greatest joy. If someone understands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that the prophets understood. If someone understands the beauty of Allah in the ways that Imams alayhim salam understood. He wouldn't need to go and look at beautiful paintings or even to go and look at beautiful nature, which are all beautiful. But for them, thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the greatest pleasure. Because nothing is more beautiful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, if we don't get that pleasure, it's because our knowledge of Allah is limited. Although, He is in reality the most pleasant thing, but our knowledge is not there. Even sometimes in our Salat, we don't enjoy talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't enjoy to be able to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Not because this has no joy. No, because our understanding is limited. Imagine a person who is sitting, for example, in a bus, in a train, next to the greatest scholar in the world. Imagine you are sitting next to Allah Taba Tabai, for example. But you don't know who is this man. So you don't enjoy. So he seems to be a nice person, but you don't know who he is. But if you know he's a great alim like Allah Taba Tabai, then you just want to look at his face, look at his eyes, listen to him, even if you don't understand. You want to listen to him. So, it's a matter of recognition. So, now, I want to elaborate on this concept a little bit and see how can we ascend to heights of this type of pleasure which comes with recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, inshallah, we will talk about how to achieve that. So first, we want to explain the concept, what it involves, and then we want to see, inshallah, how can that be achieved. There is a discussion among our scholars. Philosophers have discussed this. Ethicists have discussed this. Mystics have discussed this. Mufassirin of Quran have discussed this, but it is an area that still perhaps needs more work and more elaboration. And that is the concept of Qurb, the concept of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is something that from childhood we talk about it. We say, I perform my salat qurbatan Allah, I fast qurbatan Allah. We also learn that you can do everything qurbatan Allah seeking closeness to Allah. 
But what is this concept? What does it mean to get closer to Allah? In human relations, in our life, we use this nearness in different senses. And some of them would not apply to nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to understand this and then inshallah we will see how we can achieve this. Nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something which can happen by a decision made by a boss or by, I don't know, for example, you know, head of an organization or, you know, by instruction given by a respected person. Nearness to Allah is not like, for example, when you choose one of your employees and say, you are my deputy. So now he is nearer to you. No, it's not like this. When it comes to positions between people, when it comes to the place that you occupy in this hierarchy of positions, you know, who is, I don't know, head of this office, who is the general director, who is, I don't know, the president, who is the king. When it comes to this type of hierarchy, it's not always a matter of change in the reality of person. It's only a matter of decision made by the person who has authority to change your position. Maybe up to 10 o'clock in the morning, you were a simple employee. Then your boss you know, says, come to my office. Then he says, from now on, you are head of this section. Have you changed in reality? Are you now a better person? Of course, some of us, you know, would be deceived and, you know, we think, oh, I am a very important and special person, you know. But in reality, you are the same person. Nothing has changed. This is just a decision which is made and this decision brings real consequences, but it's not based on a real change. You get my point? You have not changed, but because of this decision, now you can do things that you were not able to do. But you are the same person. Maybe after a few days, say, sorry, I made a mistake. <laughs> you go back to the same position. You are not changing as a person. Your personhood is not changed. It's just the function, which is changed based on a decision, based on agreement. This can be a decision from one side. This can be a decision based on agreement. Is this the same about nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Those who have a spiritual positions, if someone becomes a prophet, if someone is an imam, if someone is a friend of God, is a of Allah, if someone like Ibrahim is chosen as a friend by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is this the same? Is it like a decision that a head of an organization makes? No. It's not an appointment just made. If it is an appointment, it's declaration. It's not just appointment. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designates someone for a job or appoints someone for a job, is based on a reality. Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu rasalat. Allah knows where to put his mission. If it was just a matter of decision without any reality, there was no way to talk about Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu. Because it's not a matter of knowledge. It can be arbitrary decision. But because this is based on reality, real qualifications, then we can say, okay, Allah knows who is the more qualified or the most qualified. So, nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like going higher or ascending in a hierarchy of political position or, I don't know, institutional organizational positions. So this is not the case. Nearness to Allah is not also a real relation with Allah in the sense that everything which is created by Allah is near to Him because they totally depend on Him. You know, we have this hadith, Al-Mu'minu 
اشد اتصالا بالله من ضوء الشمس بالشمس a believer is more connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than radiation of sun to sun Though a shams is the light coming from sun. How close is, how near is these rays of light to sun? Mu'man is closer to Allah. Philosophers say that the relation between a cause and effect is what they call azafiyya ishraqiyya. Means one side is originated by the other side and the other side is not independent, like sun originating light. Indeed, it's even more, because when sun originates light, then light can depart sun, and even after sun disappears, for example, or you know is not existing anymore, and still this light can continue. You know, there are stars that maybe they are destroyed, but still the light is coming to us. Because it takes, you know, light many, many years to reach us. They are very far. So some of the, the stars that the light comes to us, maybe they don't exist anymore. Okay? Allah's relation with His creation is even more than this. Because they cannot exist without Allah even for a moment. But even this doesn't explain the nearness of moment. Why? Because this nearness, although it is a ne real nearness, but it is for everything. Every being, every human being, every animal, everyone is near to Allah in this sense. Even a kafir in this sense is near to Allah. We shouldn't think that a kafir is far from Allah in this existential sense. Even a kafir depends on Allah. So, we have to find another meaning for nearness. We have to find a meaning for nearness that can be in, found in some people and not all people. That can be found in good people and not bad people. And this is where then ulama again have different explanations. Some say nearness to Allah, which is in good people, in pious people, is nearness to Allah in qualities, in attributes, in sifat, in characteristics, in akhlaq. You know, we have had this takhallabu bi akhlaq Allah. Try to equip yourselves with the traits of character that Allah has, with the qualities that Allah has. Of course, those qualities which are shared. Because there are some qualities of Allah that we can never acquire. Indeed, for us, instead of being a virtue, would be wise. If we want to resemble Allah in His kebriya, then in us works in a negative way. Then it becomes for us arrogance. But there are qualities that can be shared, like generosity, <coughs> mercifulness, reliability, kindness, knowledgeable, being knowledgeable. So these qualities, if you achieve or if you increase the amount of these qualities, you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, you can be closer to Allah also in His pleasure, in His happiness. Don't forget the beginning point, why we came to this discussion. So this is one explanation. Why? Resembling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more and more, you get closer to Him. This is a good explanation, and it also shows why bad people are not near to Allah in this sense. Because instead of them having the qualities of Allah, they have opposite qualities. If Allah is generous, they are miserly. If Allah is kind, they are brutal, they are merciless. Okay? So this is one explanation. Another explanation 
that some ulama have given, like Ayatollah Misbah, is that nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a matter of knowledge. But knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not through concepts, rather by presence, ilm huzuri. We have two types of knowledge. Sometimes I have no direct access to what is known. I have only some images, some concepts, like some pictures of what is known. You talk about a place that I have never been there. You describe, then I develop some understanding of that place. But this is just through images. We come even further. Philosophers say even about the places that you have seen. First I said the places that you haven't seen. But they say even the places that you have seen. Your knowledge is through images. Even when I am looking at this microphone, my understanding of this microphone is through the image that I have from this microphone. I have no direct knowledge. And therefore they say that image is ma'luma bizzat, that image is what is known primarily, and then the microphone itself is ma'luma bil araz, it is known secondarily. But the good news is that that image corresponds to that reality, therefore it's a true image, then I can know that. For most of people, 99.99 perhaps, their knowledge of God is through concepts. They think of God as a person, as a being who has created this world. This is a general knowledge. This is a universal way of knowing God. This is kulli. This is not about God as a person, as a real reality with whom you can relate and establish personal relationship. We have knowledge of ourselves in two ways. And we can have the same experience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes I know of myself, I'm sorry that tonight we have become too philosophical, this was not the plan, but it became like this. So, we have two types of knowledge of ourselves. One is knowledge of myself through concepts. For example, when I say, I was born in this town in this state. I am using concepts which refer to me but these concepts are different from me. But your understanding of yourself without using concepts, your understanding of your joy and fear, your understanding of your hunger and thirst, this is knowledge by presence. This is El Huzuri. Okay? Our ulama say and you yourself also, perhaps in some uh, situations, have experienced this. But, inshallah, we will explain that this can, can be a continuous experience for some people. It's possible that we come to a position, we come to a kind of encounter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that instead of using concepts in order to come to know him, we can feel him and be in his presence and recognize him in the same way that we have recognition of ourselves and our feelings, our qualities. So, that's the closest relation that a person have, has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He feels Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly without using any concept, without using any image. So, according to this understanding, orb is to have knowledge by presence, ilm huzuri, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have this type of knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would not be 
please with anything replacing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with anything replacing this experience you just want to be in this position you don't want any distraction Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam said Ilahi man dalladhi dhaqa halawata mahabbatika farama minka badala O oh Allah, who is the one who has tasted the sweetness of your love? Then he has looked for a replacement. Okay, my question is, when you taste the sweetness of something, isn't this a knowledge by presence? If I read that, you know, for example, Baglawa is sweet, this is not that experience. But when you have the taste of sweetness and you feel it and you have this knowledge by presence of your feeling of sweetness of this then I tell you I want to give you something which is bitter or it is sweet but not that sweet you will never replace this with that one say no I am enjoying please don't you know disturb me don't distract me I don't want to change this situation so those who have this type of understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they get so much pleasure that they don't want to think about anything else. And when I say they don't want, it doesn't mean that this is something that they need to think about it. This is very natural. You know, when Amirul al in Salat, they wanted to take out the arrow from his leg, and you know he didn't notice it's not that this was a decision Imam you know took he said shall I pay more attention to Allah or to this pain then he said no it's better to pay more attention to Allah and to my salah no it's natural Imam doesn't need to think about it and make decision when you are absorbed by the sweetness of your salat then you don't need to think whether I am going for a replacement it doesn't occur to you. You don't pay attention to anything else. A mystic is not the one who is always faced with a dilemma. Shall I go towards Allah or go towards other things? A mystic is the one that he has no other choice in his mind. He is not in need of making decision. We are the people who are always in the middle or people like me. And if we are good, we say, okay, we go towards Allah. And in our bad days, sometimes we go to other directions. But for a mystic, for an artist, for a lover of Allah, there are no two, three options. He only sees one option. He doesn't see any other option. Okay? So, this is the concept of nearness according to some ulama. In order to make this perhaps more understandable and to use some Quranic references I want to explain the concept of nearness from another angle I want to mention what we have in the Quran about the story of Pharaoh and the magicians Quran as you know is in maximum accuracy it's not just a matter of beauty, it's not just a matter of attraction. When it comes to accuracy also, the Quran has no resemblance. Many important concepts can be found inside the Quran, but if also you tune yourself to that accuracy. Unfortunately, many times we read the Quran and we just jump over the verses. You know, we just, you know, want to finish. But we don't get those important codes and secrets from the Quran. One of the things that I found very interesting in the Quran is that the Quran itself is explaining the meaning of nearness. You know the story of magicians. Pharaoh, in order to defeat Prophet Musa, used different techniques. He was 
in a sense clever but unfortunately not that clever to understand that he cannot defeat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some people become too much you know pleased with themselves and proud of themselves they think they can even defeat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he was not a stupid person he was a clever person but unfortunately not that clever to understand that the success comes when you work with Allah and not against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what he said he said that we are fixing a date and we come to a place which will be a common place Makan and Sawar it will be a common place and in front of public we will have a kind of challenge Prophet Musa accepted then he asked the best magicians to come from all over the territory that he had he brought the best magicians in order to defeat Musa these magicians were clever too in the same sense they were business minded so they said Pharaoh now very much needs us before we do anything for Pharaoh, we have to fix the rate because later maybe he forgets us now he needs us so we should fix the amount of payment so they said this is uh, chapter 7 verse 113 as sahara to Pharaoh. the magicians came to Pharaoh. قالوا they said is there any payment for us if we defeat Musa? They wanted to make this clear before the competition. Verse 114. He said, Yes, indeed you would be one of the people who are muqarrab to me the people who are brought nearer to me we have similar to this in another place i think it's in surah Taha, if i'm not mistaken in two places we have very similar the same question the same answer with a little change in the wording that yes indeed you would be muqarrab now from this conversation we want to draw out the definition of muqarrab don't tell me this is the word of Pharaoh. no this is not the word of Pharaoh. this is the word of god okay it's the word of god explaining in the best possible way the conversation between them so the accuracy is not the accuracy of Pharaoh. the accuracy is the accuracy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so these people they had in their mind a type of relation with Pharaoh which was based on doing something for Pharaoh for, for and getting the reward okay no love no loyalty no closeness just doing something getting something business as we do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we do something to get reward we don't do it out of love oh Allah what is my payment if I know there is no payment I don't do it you know many times we do things just in barakats not because we know that they are most pleasing to Allah no because we have been told this has great reward and you must know that sometimes maybe there is something for which no reward is mentioned because it's a new case or a particular case but in your heart you understand that it would be more pleasing to Allah than something for which generally great reward is promised 
If I mention examples, then I am worried that I might be misunderstood because I cannot explain it more. But many things that we do in our community, we do it for the sake of reward, which is promised, forgetting that at the same time, maybe there is something which is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah is not there to tell us, I will reward you more for this. So we would be pleased with following literally what we have in some texts about rewards, forgetting what can be more important in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that a mu'min has always to be worried about. Not to do just uh, the thing just for reward. Do it for the pleasure of Allah, not for the reward. Do something to please Allah, not to get something from his pocket. You know, our example with Allah is sometimes like a person who says salam to you and then he said, give me your money. So, what type of salam is this? What type of salam? You are only thinking about my pocket. You know, I saw a clip. Uh, a mother asked her very young child, very young, do you love me? And the child said, I love you when you give me cookies. <laughs> then she asked, so you don't love me when I don't, then he realized that, you know, that he gave bad me, and said, no, I love you. But the first answer was honest. <laughs> we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he is giving us, when everything is all right. But if I have headache, if I have problem, if I have loss, if I have suffering, no, I have to think about it. Of course, we say we love you all the time, but this cannot be always honest. So, these people had this type of relation with Pharaoh. We do something for you, and we want to receive payment. Okay? But, on a basis which is, if we win, we want to charge you. And kunna nahnul ghalib. There are some people charge you even if they don't win. But they say, no, if we win, we charge you. If we don't win, we don't want anything from you. But what was the answer of Pharaoh? Pharaoh said, Naam, certainly I am going to give you. But don't be pleased with this. I am going to raise you to a different type of relation. I am going to make you one of people who are muqarrab to me. Those who are muqarrab to me, then it is not a matter of payment for what they have done for me. It's a matter of giving them whatever they want. If someone is muqarrab to you, what do you do? You just try to make him happy. So then I started reflecting on this concept of being muqarrab to a king, muqarrab to Pharaoh, for example. What would a muqarrab be given? And I thought there are few elements that a muqarrab will be given. First, a muqarrab is the one who is given not necessarily because of what he has done. He would be given even without doing anything. Pharaoh says, today I want to give you a special dress, a khalba. Tomorrow says, I want to give you a piece of land. He doesn't say, you know, what you have done for me. You are my muqarrab, I want to give you. Okay, so it's not a matter of doing something and then being given something in return. The second thing, a muqarrab is the one who has permission to visit Pharaoh anytime. If you are not muqarrab, can you see Pharaoh? No. Pharaoh says, what do you want from me? They say he has done something for you, he wants a payment. So, okay, go to my treasure, treasure and take money from him. I don't want to see him. He has done something, he can go to my servant or my, I don't know, treasure and take money. Or if you are a very important person and Pharaoh says, okay, come on Tuesday, you know, between 10.55 and 11, five minutes I can see you. I don't have time to see you. Even if they have time, they pretend that they don't have time. You know, to say that we are important. So, a person who is not muqarrab 
cannot expect to see Pharaoh easily, hardly with difficulty for a limited time. And even maybe not <coughs> private. Maybe there are also hundreds of other people. It's a public, you know, reception. But if you are Muqarra, anytime you can go and see Pharaoh. Even the guard and security cannot stop you. Because they know that if they stop you, when you see the king or Pharaoh, you complain. Then they have difficulty. Because Pharaoh loves you more than those guards and securities. Okay? No one would play with someone who is Muqarra. So you can always have meeting with Pharaoh. And something else. If people have a request from Pharaoh, what can they do? They try to find a person who is Muqarrab to Pharaoh. Could you please, when you meet Pharaoh, tell him that I have this request? I cannot see him, and even if I see him and I speak to him, he will not accept from me. You see him all the time, and he trusts you. He will not disappoint you. So please intercede for me, and he will give you my request. So, Muqarrab can also intercede. Okay? So, now, let us apply this to people who are Muqarrab to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who is Muqarrab to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, what he receives from Allah is not based on what he has done. What he receives is based on what he is. It's a very important concept if I get a chance to explain. Those who are servants of Allah, they don't get things from Allah because of what they have done. They receive because of what they are. A servant receives even when he's sleeping. Because when you are sleeping, you are still servant. If you go out away, still you are servant. If you are ill, admitted in hospital, cannot do anything, still you are his servant. He gives you his, uh, your sustenance. Everything comes from him because you are servant. So those who are muqarrab to Allah, they receive from Allah based on what they are, not what they do. This is very important. Unfortunately, we want only to do something and get from Allah for what we do. We don't try to be what Allah wants and then receive from Allah for our reality. There's a big difference. The second thing, a person with Muqarrab to Allah can any time be meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe you say, Mulana, in the case of Allah, this is possible for everyone. We can always talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can always stand for prayer. I say, I'm sorry. This doesn't mean that Allah has welcomed you. If Allah welcomes you for meeting Him, then your situation is different. Your heart would feel different. Maybe in all our life, maybe there were only one Salat or few Salat in which Allah really met you in your Salat. Many times you talk to Allah, but it's not a direct communication. When Allah is answering, because he sees sincerity and attention in you, your salat is different. How many times you have spoken to Allah with his presence? It's very rare for us. But for those who are muqarrab, because they have attention to Allah, they have presence of their heart, they have presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very special. Another thing is that a muqarrab asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for other people. Indeed, a muqarrab doesn't ask about himself. Because a muqarrab receives without asking. A muqarrab asks for other people. You know, like Lady Fatima sallallahu alayhi wa If, for example, she was praying to Allah for one hour, maybe just a little of it was for herself. And when she was asked by her child, you know why? She said, Al-Jar, Thummat-Dar. 
We always say al dar thumma al jar. But Lady Father, al jar thumma al dar. And even when she asks for herself, it's just because it's a, an etiquette that we should ask, even for our little things. Otherwise, she's more concerned about others. She wants to bring goodness, love, pleasure, anything that you can think for other people, for the society. So, Mukarra is asking Allah's favor for other people. Now, inshallah, tomorrow, I am going to found, to find and bring to you, actually I found it, but I'm going to bring to you, the evidence for this from hadith. That then you will see that what I am saying is not, you know, just uh, too much philosophizing something. You would see that very clearly in our hadith, we can find evidence for this. That being close to Allah, being near to Allah, being muqarrab, has all these things that we mentioned. All these dimensions, all these, you know, benefits. And then, inshallah, we will see how we can achieve this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand Him and understand what we can do in order to please Him, inshallah. We remember these nights, our lady, Lady Zainab Salamu I just want to share with you a short poem. It is in Farsi, but also I will translate in English. And of course, we know that for Ahlul Bayt Salam, for Imam Zainul Abidin and other members of the family, the loss of Lady is a great loss. But for Lady herself, this was end of suffering. And the amount of suffering, the amount of grief and pain that this Lady had is something that we cannot even understand, let alone experience. If all the tragedies that Lady Zainab saw in even one day, day of Ashura, forget other days and nights, happen to every person. A strong men and women, they will die. They will have heart attack. They cannot cope with it. But this lady, this Ummul Masaib, had such a heart connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she went through all these difficulties and tragedies, but never even for a second developed any bad idea about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never thought that Allah has abandoned them. And indeed, she said, وَمَا رَأَيْتُ إِلَّا جَمِيلًا As tamas taziyan As tamas taziyan Her tani azurd bu in the afternoon of Ashura, the bodies of the children and lady were all beaten by enemies and bruised. Sahnara Abbas Agar Midid Bishak Murdabu. If Abu Fazl was alive and seeing this, situation, he would have definitely died. Taburu be ruza shura khuda khud shahid as amme ye sadat ra kucha kasi nashmurd bu Allah himself is a witness that before the afternoon of Ashura, Zainab was never humiliated. She had maximum respect whenever she was going to visit the shrine of the Prophet. 
She was escorted by Amir al-Mu'minin, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and Abu al-Fazl al-Abbas. Going to ask Karbala whenever she wanted to go anywhere. She had Abbas and other brothers. She was putting her foot on the knees of Abbas and riding the camel. But in the afternoon of Ashura, in the night after Ashura, the situation changed. As Amon saw at Kisab Tarab Samt al Hale Zainab missed the sun high, Baradar Murdebu. From the moment that Abbas moved towards Al Ghamid, the situation of Zainab was like a woman who has already lost her brother. خاص در آغوش خود گیرد و سیل اجرا نشد بس که تیر و نیزه بر جسم و سیل اج خورده بود When she lost her و سیل she wanted to at least embrace the body of her سیل but the body was so much damaged and covered by sword and spear that she could not even touch the body of Hussein. Fekr mi kardan nifrin kard dar alik hu Dast hai ashraf baray shukr bala burde hu in that difficult time when she raised her hand towards the sky, some thought that she wants to curse people who did this to Hussein. But indeed she was asking Allah to accept this sacrifice from them, and she was thanking Allah. ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منغلب ينغلبون نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم وبفاطمة وأبيا In the night of Juma, in the month of Rajab, we ask Allah for help. Ya Allah, 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 Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Arham Ar-Rahamim Ya Mughallab Al-Ghulub Thabbid Ghulubana Ala Deenik Wakfina Ya Qadhi Al-Hajat Wa Ya Kafi Al-Muhimmat Inna Ka'la Kul Shayin Ghadir Oh Allah, please send your salutation to Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Please let us be with Muhammad and Ali Muhammad in dunya and the akhirah. Oh Allah, please enable us to serve you till we die. Please keep us and our children generation by generation on the right path. Please make our Imam Zaman happy 
and please with us. Please answer his du'as for his farad. Please give healing and shifa to all who are ill, all who suffer from illness. Please send your rahmah to all who have passed away, those who have rights upon us, our parents and for parents and teachers and marajah, our ulama who have served the community. Please let them be with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Please give life of blessings and support to all who serve you and your religion. Please make the last moment of our life the best moment of our life. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين.